All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to How Deer Shape Forest Ecosystems. It's really great to see so many of you here today. I think this is going to be an interesting talk. So today I'm going to do a quick welcome, talk to you a little bit about what APIP or who APIP is, what APIP is, what we do. Uh, then we're going to get right into the main event, How Deer Shape Forest Ecosystems. We'll have a Q&A with Brendan Querian. He's our main speaker, and that'll be right after his talk. Uh, I'll ask you all to please, if you have questions, please put them in the chat, and we'll be monitoring that chat, and we'll uh, ask Brendan the questions uh, during that Q&A time. Um, and then, you know, if, if we get to the end of that and you have another question, we'll let people come off mute and ask him. But we like to kind of go through the questions in the chat first. Uh, then after the Q&A, we're going to talk about invasive species that benefit from deer browse. And then we're going to go over how to prevent the spread of invasive species. And we'll have a final Q&A at the end of it. Uh, so, yeah, feel free to jot down your questions, pop them in the chat, and uh, we'll get to them in those Q&As. Today's speakers are Brendan Quirian, Zach Simic, and myself. I'm Sean Kittle. Um, Brendan is our main speaker. He's a big game biologist with New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, or DEC. Uh, Zach Simic is a conservation and GIS analyst with the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, which I will refer to as APIP from now on. And I am the Invasive Species Communications Coordinator for APIP. I work with Zach. So what is the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program? For those of you who aren't aware, we are actually one of eight uh, partnerships for regional invasive species management across New York State. Uh, we were the first one. Uh, our service area is the Adirondack Park and north to the Canadian border. You can see it on the map there. Uh, our program is funded by the Environmental Protection Fund, which is administered by DEC. And we are housed in the Nature Conservancy's Keene Valley office right here in the Adirondacks. Very beautiful Keene Valley. APIP's mission is to work in partnership to minimize the impact of invasive species on the Adirondack region's communities, lands, and waters. Since invasive species are primarily spread by human activity, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that later, uh, our outreach efforts largely revolve around public education and prevention. Uh, basically, it's a lot easier to prevent invasive species from spreading than it is to deal with them once they're here. Uh, we also empower the public through trainings, where we teach people to identify invasive species, uh, to report invasive species and to do their own management of invasive species that might be on their property or in their uh, lake or nearby water body. And out in the field, our team focuses on managing existing priority infestations to mitigate their negative impacts. We're able to work on land and we're also able to work in aquatic spaces, managing aquatic invasive plants and animals. You can learn more about all of this at uh, www.adkinvasives.com. You can also follow us on social media. You'll see more information there. And without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Brendan, our main speaker. Thanks, Sean, and um, welcome, everyone. Good morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to come and speak on this topic that's near and dear to my heart, no pun intended. Um, and uh, before I, I really go into the, the meat of this presentation, I want to start out with some basic uh, terrestrial ecology and natural history, because that's really going to set the stage for how we got to where we are in the deer management realm in New York and um, provide some additional context for you as to um, some of the problems that we're facing now. Um, looks like, there we go. Okay, so terrestrial ecology, basic terrestrial ecology teaches us that there are three primary trophic levels in terrestrial ecosystems. Our primary producers are vegetation, our herbivores, in this case, I'm gonna be focusing on deer, and then our predators. And we've had a, a suite of apex predators historically, wolves, mountain lions, and us. And then our mesopredators, bobcat, lynx, coyote, and black bear. And then we also have abiotic factors like um, severe winters that have historically helped keep deer populations in check. When subsistence hunting transitioned to unregulated market hunting, deer populations were almost brought to the brink of extinction across New York State. There were just remnant populations in the Adirondacks with the majority of the rest of New York devoid of deer. And this was um, something that the Adirondacks was, um, was kind of known for. So hunters from the cities would come up to the Adirondacks, harvest large numbers of deer, 
and then ship them down to the cities via train for um, city residents to consume. And during that same process, we also had two of our apex predators extirpated from New York State, wolves and mountain lions. It's also important to recognize that over that period of time, there's been tremendous changes in habitat and land use across New York State. So these vast uh, primeval forests that you would have experienced if you had come to New York uh, a couple centuries ago look more like this. Um, forests have been fragmented. There's a lot more agriculture, a lot more early successional habitat. And this has all been to the benefit of deer. So now let's, let's fast forward to present day. We have essentially what I'm going to demonstrate in this series of slides is what's known in ecology as a, a trophic cascade. And what a, a trophic cascade is, is essentially if you perturb or, um, disturb some level of an ecosystem, it has cascading effects through the other levels. And that's what I want to show um, visually as to what's going on in the deer situation. So as I mentioned previously, we've lost two of our apex predators from New York, wolves and mountain lions. And this has reduced the amount of mortality on deer from natural sources. And because of that, deer populations have been allowed to expand in certain areas. And this has increased the amount of browse pressure on vegetation. So vegetation has been compromised in areas as a result of this. Our subsistence hunting framework has also transitioned to recreational hunting as our primary source of deer mortality and deer vehicle collisions. However, this is much different than the level of mortality that subsistence hunting provided on deer. Recreational hunters um, have, um, essentially less access to land um, now than they did before. Uh, many of them are really more interested in harvesting bucks than does, and I'll get to why that's important later on in this presentation. And hunter numbers are on the decline across the country. So recreational hunting isn't providing the, the same level of management intensity or, or mortality on deer that it once did. And lastly, these um, abiotic factors that have historically kept deer populations in check, like in areas like the Adirondacks and Catskills, are no longer as, as present or severe. So we haven't experienced a severe winter in the Adirondacks for eight or nine years now. And that has also allowed deer populations to grow um, beyond what is historical. And this has, again, resulted in um, impacts to our, our um, primary producers and vegetation. In, in that previous slide, it kind of made it seem like we're losing our forest. I don't want to paint that picture. It's a, it's a more complex situation. And so um, I want to dive into how deer are actually changing the abundance and diversity of plants in our, in our forests. I'm sorry, I'm just going to close this. I got the sun coming through my window here. So on this slide, what we're seeing is a kind of a model of a, a forest understory setting where we have plants um, a diversity of plants and abundance of plants. The ones in green are representing plants that have high nutrients and palatability to deer. And orange is kind of moderate nutrients and palatability. And then red is our low in nutrients and low in palatability. So what we would expect is as deer populations increase, the first plants that we would lose in these ecosystems are the ones that deer prefer. The ones that are, have high nutrients and high palatability. As deer populations continue to increase, we would expect next that those moderate preference plants would be lost. And this is where the plants that are low in nutrients and low in palatability actually have opportunity to expand. And some of these plants can be invasive. And I'll, I'll show, some, and, and Zach will um, share some of the, the specific species that benefit from excessive deer browse. In the, the worst case situation, deer can completely um, remove understory vegetation from the forest. So you have this vacant understory with very little to no vegetation remaining. And so these are some of the species that deer prefer. Things like trilliums, uh, hemlock, orchids, yew, oak seedlings. 
And I'd, I'd like you to think about the last time that you were in a forest setting and if you saw these species. Probably not. Even if you go into a hemlock forest or an oak forest, we're mostly looking up at the mature trees. If you look down, when was the last time you saw a hemlock seedling? When was the last time you saw an oak seedling? That's the future of our forest. And that's what's missing in a lot of areas of New York State. And because they're, the main reason that they're missing is, is deer browse impacts. And what they've, these systems have transitioned to, in many instances, are things that look like this. So I mentioned species that have low palatability and low nutrition. If you think about some of the chemical and structural defenses that invasive plants have, they are prime for taking over in these habitats that no longer have native vegetation to suppress their spread. So things like garlic mustard, Japanese barberry, multiflora rose, these are all ones that benefit from excessive deer browse. Japanese or uh, uh, stilt grass is another one because it's high in lignin content. It doesn't have much nutrition for deer. And then this can also benefit certain native species. So things like American beech and um, striped maple also benefit from excessive deer browse. We also have to remember that deer are, are um, really key, keystone species in ecosystems because of their seed dispersal abilities. When deer feed on um, invasives or, or native vegetation that have abundant berries and seeds, they deposit those seeds throughout the ecosystem. And there's been numerous studies that have propagated the species from deer pellets, plant species from deer pellets, and they do spread invasives very um, readily and they deposit um, these seeds along their primary travel corridors. So an early detection approach to invasive species spread is to actually go into an area where uh, deer are known to occupy and follow the deer trails coming out of it. You might find invasives along those paths. They also change nutrient cycles in the environment. So deer tend to go and feed in the evenings and at night and then come back to a particular bedding area during the day. And while they're in that area during the day, they're defecating and, and um, essentially depositing nutrients in those particular areas. And there's been research that demonstrates that this actually promotes the um, introduction and spread of other invasives like um, invasive earthworms because those nutrients are dynamics are, are, uh, have been changed and are so rich in that particular area. So it should come as no surprise, based on all of that, that we're experiencing deer impacts across New York State. And here's some examples of that. This is often what's referred to as the green lie. If you were untrained or um, didn't really understand what was going on in these photos, you might think, oh, things are perfectly fine here. And I want to show you what the problem is. So in the, in the top left corner, this is after a, a timber harvest. And you'd expect that the opening of the canopy and availability of light would result in tremendous regeneration in this particular situation. But the deer have browsed down all of the stump sprouts and regeneration that's coming up so that that forest cannot regenerate. In the middle photo here, we have an understory that's completely dominated by Japanese barberry, essentially because deer have browsed down everything else and they don't prefer barberry. So barberry has been able to spread. Over here on the right, we have hay-scented fern. Hay-scented fern is another one that deer do not prefer. And because of excessive deer browse pressure, it is allowed to spread in understory forest settings. And then the ones along the bottom here are examples of where deer have essentially um, browsed down everything in the forest understory to literally almost nothing. So on the left, we have some remnant grasses in the understory here that are uh, low preference. The bottom, Middle photo is an example of a deer browse line across those um, cedars where you can literally see that area of, of vacant vegetation. And then on the bottom right is another example where you can see that browse line and literally very little uh, vegetation remaining in that understory setting. And of course, this has tremendous impacts, not just to vegetation, but to all the species, other species that rely on that vegetation. 
So um, some call this a, a trophic ricochet. Essentially, the vegetation has been removed, understory vegetation has been removed or compromised in these settings. And because of that, all these other species up above in the food chain are impacted. And so there's been research demonstrating that this has impacts to ground nesting birds, small mammals, and invertebrates. And it's likely that there's impacts to other species higher up the food chain that haven't been evaluated. How do we know it's deer? Well, this is what it looks like when you fence deer out of these systems. So all of these photos are inside and out of deer exclosures. And so you see the tremendous response of vegetation inside these fences when deer are removed from the system. Now, I wanna be clear that these are also artificial systems because we don't want to remove deer entirely from the system. We want them to be at a level that's in balance with um, available habitat. That's what our, we're aiming for here. But it gives us a very good sense of what, what would happen if we could achieve better balance. And because of this, many ecologists have um, considered deer even a greater th threat than climate change in particular ecosystems. This is a, a report that came out just last year. Our threat, a threat to forest bigger than climate change, deer. And there's also these other societal and economic impacts that we have to consider. So uh, deer are um, causing tremendous crop damage to farmers across the state. They also cause landscape damage and ornamental damage. They're a um, component of the spread of tick-borne diseases. And of course, deer vehicle collisions are a major problem in certain areas of the state. This article just came out last year as well, earlier this year, I should say. Fear the deer crash data illuminates America's deadliest animal. And they found that deer are responsible for the deaths of about 440 of the estimated 458 Americans killed in physical confrontations with wildlife in a given year. This makes deer the most dangerous animal in North America, surprisingly. The other thing to remember here is that this is not a good situation for the deer. When deer exceed habitat carrying capacity and we do receive a um, severe winter, they can starve to death, essentially. They will go through a winter trying to survive on the little that's left remaining to browse on, and that deep snow and cold conditions is too much for them and will have massive winter die-off events. And this has happened historically in areas of the Adirondacks and Catskills. It's also not a good situation for disease transmission and spread. So, um, the past three years, we've experienced outbreaks of epizootic hemorrhagic disease in New York State, primarily in the Hudson Valley and the Great Lakes region and Long Island. And then one that's on the way that hasn't um, been in New York since 2005 is chronic wasting disease. We know that both of these diseases spread much more rapidly and have greater impacts on deer when deer density is high. It makes sense, right? We just went through this as a society where social distancing and making sure that we were taking proper precautions with COVID was so important. The same thing goes with deer. If you have high concentrations of deer in a particular area, they're going to be spreading diseases to each other more rapidly and effectively. This is a picture of my technician a couple of years ago um, who was picking up a deer in a pond that had died from epizootic hemorrhagic disease. But that particular year in 2021, I was fielding hundreds of calls from people throughout the Hudson Valley that had deer dying in their pools, under their porches, um, on their lawns. It was really a bad situation. And so um, again, it emphasizes to me that we need to keep deer populations in balance with available habitat so that when we receive outbreaks like this, they're not as severe. So given all that, the question to me is, is can we restore balance, right? This is the question for all of us. And whenever I consider this um, inside and out of the exposure picture, I refer to this quote. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends to do otherwise. And this is a quote by Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife management. Obviously, if we look at this photo, something is wrong. If you look at the outside, right? And we need to do something about it. The question is how and, and you know, what resource, resources can we bear to address it? And to answer that question, we really need to understand what's called population demography. 
this is a science that, and, and math, mathematical science that evaluates what levers we can pull in a population to either increase population size or decrease population size. And for deer, it's pretty simple. We have um, juveniles, fawns that are born in the spring. They have a certain probability of surviving to be an adult deer. Those adult deer also have a certain probability of surviving to be into the, into the next age class, adult age class. And then it's really the does and doe fawns that produce new fawns have a certain fecundity rate that drives population growth. What's interesting about white-tailed deer is that doe fawns, as early as six months of age, if they reach a certain weight by their first breeding season, can go into heat and be bred. So you're having very young individuals um, contribute to that new cohort of deer. And this is why po deer populations can grow so rapidly over short periods of time. The key takeaway here though, is that if we're trying to reduce deer population size, we have to focus on the top part of this model or equation. If you just remove an adult buck from this equation, you're removing that one individual. If you remove a doe or a doe fawn from the equation, not only are you removing that individual, you're removing all of her future offspring. And that's why we focus on female deer harvest as our primary management tool. That's how we're going to address deer population growth. Okay, going back to this before and now situation, I would argue that neither one of these is sustainable. In the first example, we had essentially a situation where deer almost became extirpated on the landscape because of overhunting, overhunting through regu unregulated market hunting. On the right, we have a situation where deer populations have become so large that they're compromising their own habitat and, and the habitat for everything else, and also having these economic and social impacts. <clears throat> so the question is, what can we do to try and find a, a happy medium between these two? And using, using the process of elimination, we can automatically remove deer vehicle collisions as a strategy that we can use to control population size. That's not something we can, you know, it's not ethical or, or um, reasonable to consider. We also have very limit, limited ability to control the weather. It's not like we can ask mother nature to produce another severe winter for us. So that leaves us with, with very few options that we can, and, um, you know, change in this situation. What do we have at our disposal? Well, we can encourage, empower, and promote antlerless harvest within rec the recreational hunting community so that they're acting more like subsistence hunters as opposed to just buck hunters. And or we can bring apex predators back into the system. However, there's a major caveat with apex predators in particular. We have to remember that the landscape has changed, especially in urban and suburban areas. Can you imagine introducing apex predators into a situation like this to try and control deer population size? I can't. To play devil's advocate though, can recreational hunting be an effective tool in these situations? Probably not. If the population density is so high that hunters cannot access land or meet the minimum setback distances to remain safe and effective, what are we going to do here? This is why many states have also incorporated deer calls into their management scheme. So this is a essentially sharpshooting of deer, where deer have to be taken out of these urban areas because of the level of impacts that they're having. And so, um, Several state agencies and private organizations work with these professional sharpshooters and um, remove deer strategically in these areas so that the impacts can be minimized. But again, it's very controversial um, and usually takes many years to convince um, stakeholders that it's necessary and um, to really win them over as far as the level of benefit it provides. So where do we go from here? We know what the options are that we have at our disposal. What else can we do 
to change the situation and improve deer management. Well, one of the things I'd love to see is more property owners understanding the benefits that recreational hunting has on um, deer management and promoting the health of our ecosystems and opening their lands to hunting. With the caveat that those hunters that they allow have to take antlerless deer, not just bucks. I also wanna see more people engaged in hunting. So this is a, a picture of my wife who um, took her first deer a couple of years ago. She took a nice, nice doe, um, opening day of the Southern Zone gun season. And why did she want to do it? She wanted to know where her food came from. She wanted to uh, be more sustainable in getting sourcing her, her own meat. These are all great values that hunting can provide that are um, under underrealized or under um, utilized by hunters. And to the end, I want more people to fully utilize the venison food resource. So this is a picture of, of my freezer. Most of my meat, probably 95% of my meat consumption is venison. And as a result of that, I haven't needed to purchase beef. I haven't needed to purchase pork. And all of the environmental consequences of um, large scale meat production, I don't have to worry about. I also want more people to harvest deer, not for themselves, but to donate. I'd like more people to utilize the Venison Donation Coalition to address food insecurity. These are all things that, again, would really change how we're thinking about deer management in New York and encourage, encourage more people to participate and be engaged. I'd also like more people to engage in for deer impact monitoring. So going out on your property and evaluating whether deer are a problem or not. And then if they are a problem, making changes to your management on your property to improve ecosystem health. This is something that anyone can do. And there are a variety of protocols out there that you can utilize on your own property to get a sense of whether you need to be doing something or not. And then lastly, in urban and municipal areas, I'd like more community officials and leaders to engage in urban deer management planning. So working with your municipality to develop a deer management plan and implementing it when necessary. And luckily, many of these things are articulated in our current management plan for white-tailed deer in New York State, which has the primary goals of population management, hunting and recreation, conflict and damage management, education and communication, and deer habitat. So transitioning now, I'd like I'd like to talk about how what tools DEC utilizes across the state to address uh, deer impacts and population size. <clears throat> so what this graph depicts is this, the tools that we have at our disposal at various scales and their management intensity. So at the statewide scale, recreational hunting remains the most effective and cost-effective option at our disposal to address populations. As you get lower down in the um, geographic scale, so for individual properties, for example, we can do things like our deer management assistance program or deer damage permits that provide very intense targeted uh, control of deer in localized areas. And so I'm gonna walk us through each one of these um, over the next series of slides. So statewide, recreational hunting is again, our primary management tool. We, each year we issue um, hunting licenses to recreational hunters and a certain number of tags that they can utilize. And so what you're, what you're seeing here is what a typical, typical hunter would receive if they went and purchased their big game hunting license and took advantage of all of the different privileges and deer management permits that are available to them at point of sale. They would receive one antler deer tag if they just had their um, big game hunting license. If they had their archery privilege, they would receive another either sex deer tag. If they had their um, purchase their muzzleloading privilege, they would get another antlerless deer tag. And then if they applied for deer management permit permits, which are antlerless deer tags, they could receive an additional two tags per season. So right out right out of the gate, many hunters are starting with close to five deer tags that they can utilize during a given hunting season. 
And the main thing I want to emphasize here is that these deer management permits, which again are antlerless deer tags, are what we manipulate the number of in each wildlife management unit across the state to address population size. So how do we determine how many DMPs should be issued in a particular area? I want to go through how we establish the deer population trajectories across the state. Our first lens that we look through is whether deer are having an impact on forest regeneration in that particular WMU or wildlife management unit. And the research that we, we um, utilize to evaluate that is um, based on a paper by Miller and McGill. Whoops, sorry. Um, that was published in, I believe, 2019 that evaluated what's called regeneration debt. So in this series of map, you're seeing the average number of seedlings per square meter on the left and the average number of saplings per square meter on the right. And the areas of gray essentially are where there's a mismatch. You know, the seedlings that were um, regenerating have not reached the upper um, height classes as, of saplings. Something has happened to prevent them to become a sapling. And so, the again, the primary issue here is, is deer. Deer are browsing down that um, those seedlings before they can become saplings. The next question we ask is whether deer are primarily responsible for that poor regeneration. And if we were able to reduce the deer population, would we see improvement in forest regeneration? And this is based on a paper by Martin Lesser et al. This map shows the areas of the state where a 25% deer herd reduction would improve seedling density. So those areas of orange and red here are where if we could reduce the deer population by at least 25%, we would expect forest regeneration to improve um, fairly significantly. And then lastly, we pull in some social science. We survey um, residents of New York State randomly and ask them what their preference is. Do you want to see more deer, fewer deer, or the same number of deer? And this also comes into play for our, our management trajectories in determining whether we want to increase, maintain, or decrease the population. <clears throat> and so based on that last round of uh, decision making, this is these are the outcomes. Essentially, the lower Hudson Valley and Long Island are, and um, the central New York region are where we're targeting to decrease the population by at least 25%. The rest of the state is stay the same, and in nowhere in the state are we trying to increase the population. And so again, how are we doing this? How are we attempting to do this? We're issuing DMPs, deer management permits or antlerless deer tags, in these units where we need to maintain the population or decrease it. And so this is the latest map that shows our 2022 uh, deer management permit issuance in relation to 2021. And you'll see that in the majority of the state, we're increasing the number of DMPs available, these um, blue wildlife management units that you're seeing. In very few instances are we decreasing uh, the number of DMPs available. I also want to mention here that you'll notice that the Adirondacks doesn't have any DMPs available. Why is that? Well. DEC is prohibited from issuing DMPs in the Adirondacks in statute. And this is going to be a, a major problem for us moving forward, especially as climate change and fewer severe winters allow deer population growth in the Adirondacks and North Country. And so DMPs, again, are antlerless deer only. They're wildlife management unit specific. They can be used during all deer hunting seasons. You can through, receive two DMPs through our instant lottery system. Two additional DMPs can be transferred to you from other hunters. And you can receive two DMPs in wildlife, man wildlife management units with leftover tags. So if you took advantage of these other opportunities, you can have close to 11 or 12 deer tags at your disposal going into the hunting season. So tags are not limited here. Hunters have plenty of opportunity to harvest antler deer, antlerless deer. The issue is that many of them choose not to. Our recent analysis indicates that um, fewer than 12% uh, of hunters harvest one antlerless deer per year, and less than 4% harvest two or more antlerless deer per year. So 84% of our hunters are not engaging in antlerless deer harvest currently, and that's a major problem for us. 
At the community or municipal level, we have um, our community deer management guide. Again, we're trying to encourage municipalities that are dealing with uh, deer impact to become more involved and engaged. And so things like urban deer hunts, utilizing our deer management assistance program and deer damage permits are something that we're encouraging these communities to do. And then at the individual property scale, we have do two different tools available to landowners. Our first is our deer management assistance program. This allows for property specific deer management by giving additional antlers deer tags for hunters on the property. So in addition to all the tags that a hunter may receive, if you participate in DMAP and are approved, your hunters can receive additional antlers deer tags up to four per hunter in units where our objective is to decrease the population and up to two per hunter in units where it's to maintain the population. This is a free application available um, by August 1st. And it's a three-year permit window. As long as you report each year, you are you continue to be enrolled, and then you have to renew your application after three years. And our primary um, customers here are farmers. Farmer, farmers utilize DMAP as a impact reduction on their crops. We also issue them for forestry generation, custom deer management to municipalities, public refuge refuges, and for significant natural community protection. And then lastly, our most intense management tool is our deer damage permit program. This is meant to address acute deer damage that's occurring outside of the hunting season. And it allows non-hunting related techniques, things like shooting deer at night, using bait, um, and other more intense management options. There's a free application for this as well with no deadline. And then there's, there's an annual application reporting requirement. And again, the um, primary stakeholders that we're engaged in with deer damage permits are farmers, municipalities, and parks and preserves. I think it's also important to mention and emphasize that there are certain restrictions on what DEC can do that are established in statute, and that if changed, would make deer management more efficient and effective across New York State. These are articulated in Appendix 8 of our current deer management plan. I'm just going to emphasize some of them here that I think um, could really move the needle for us if, if addressed. So the one highlighted in here um, is the one I mentioned previously. Currently, there is no ability for DEC to issue deer management permits or antlers deer tags in the Adirondacks. That's a major issue. Um, essentially, with, pop, with um, milder winters and population growth, we have no ability to address it besides the standard tags that hunters receive. Allowing firearms to take deer during the regular season in Suffolk and Westchester County, granting full authority to regulate crossbow use, allowing deer hunting in currently closed areas like Nassau County and parts of Albany, Erie, and Monroe counties, allowing use of firearms to take deer in areas that are currently restricted to bow only, and then these can these um, other statutes, if modified, will, would allow culling to be more effective. So using bait within 300 feet of a road, shooting from a vehicle and within 500 feet of a structure. Um, I, can't, I can't actually see the last one because it's cut off. But again, these are the things that we would like to have changed so that DEC and our partners can be more effective in deer management. <clears throat> so going back, back to this slide and, and trying to summarize things here. We know there's an issue, right? I think I've, I've demonstrated that well enough. The question is what we're going to do about it. And this is not something that um, we can just sit on our laurels on. I feel like every everyone has a, an obligation to participate in this, whether you're a property owner and can open your, your land up to hunting, or whether you can shift some of your meat consumption to venison. There's ways to become involved, even if you're not hunting yourself. And so I encourage you to become more involved and in, in engaged in this topic, maybe even just go out and evaluate some of the deer impacts on your property and report them to DEC so that we have a better sense of what's happening in your local area. Um, and again, there's um, implications for invasives that Zach is going to talk, uh, talk about here as well. If we can address the deer situation, in many instances, the invasive species situation is improved. There's been research that essentially demonstrates if you remove deer from a particular ecosystem, species like um, multiflora rose, garlic mustard, and barberry go away or are much reduced. So um, it has multiple benefits that um, can be experienced if everyone becomes engaged. 
with that, I'll um, hand it over to Zach and I appreciate um, the opportunity to come and, and present today. All right, thank you so much, Brendan. That was fascinating. Uh, we do have some comments here in the chat. Um, Brendan, what differences are there between effects of deer browse in big woods uh, like the Adirondacks versus woodlot slash farmland in the southern tier? Yeah, there's major differences. The, um, the primary difference is related to canopy closure. So in old growth forest or, or big woods, as you're, you're calling it, uh, light limitations are preventing much regeneration on the forest understory. Whereas in the southern tier, where you have fragmented forests, a lot of early successional forest, those light limitations aren't present and you have much more early successional vegetation. When you have more early successional vegetation, it distributes browse pressure. So if you have deer densities that increase in areas like the Adirondacks, there's not enough vegetation to distribute that browse pressure effectively. And so impacts can be even more severe. Um, that's, that's the main difference I would see. So anywhere where you have um, reduced vegetation in the understory and deer populations begin to grow in size, it's going to create problems. Hey, we have a question. I, this is probably referring to the uh, where you're going through the past and present. The question is, why isn't the black bear in the right column? As an apex predator? I think so. Yeah, I think that's what it, 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 if Mark wants to come off mute, Mark, ask the question and, and clarify. That would be fine. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's Mark Storty talking. Um, you know, we we're seeing a lot of black bear in or around the periphery of uh, the Adirondacks. The population is increasing. Uh, we're seeing that as a it is a major predator. We know in the Adirondacks for fawns and young deer. We've seen them hunt them. I've seen them hunt hunt deer. Uh, so I think you know once again it is part of the equation that black bears do impact white-tailed deer populations, especially the fawn issue that you're you're you were discussing. Absolutely. I, I agree. So the, the main difference between an apex predator and a mesopredator is that an apex predator relies almost entirely on deer as its food source. So wolves and mountain lions would fall into that category. Mesopredators utilize deer to some extent, but also feed on a variety of other things. So black bears are omnivores. They will feed on deer opportunistically. Um, as you mentioned, they're, they're very good predators of fawns but they also feed on a variety of other things. And um, especially as um, adult deer, they're not as effective predators on. All right, thanks. Uh, so Steve is asking, can DEC provide more funds for deer fencing? We cannot. We don't have the ability to provide funding for fencing. Uh, can you let people hunt to sell meat? That's another um, legal constraint right now. So one of the things that we could consider is instituting some type of pseudo um, market hunting again. But again, um, in statute, DEC is prevented from allowing the sale of venison in New York state. If that was changed, then you could essentially encourage hunters to harvest deer and sell that meat to local restaurants or um, other businesses that would utilize it. That's just not an option for us currently, but we'd love to see that change. Hey, we have a question from Zach. Um, in lieu of DMPs in the Adirondacks, does DEC have the regulatory authority uh, to increase how muzzleloader season length to increase opportunities for antler antlerless harvest? Yeah, there are other tools at our disposal. We could consider um, extending season length as one option. Um, the issue is that, you know, we, we've extended seasons in other areas of the state and we haven't seen dramatic increases in antlerless harvest. Maybe that would change in areas of the Adirondacks. And it's certainly something we're considering, but, um, it doesn't seem really to be enough to, to get at what we need from a management standpoint. Well, and we, um, 
Okay, so the, the comment here is I have DMAPs and use DMPs uh, to no overall effect on regeneration rates, but cannot get a damage permit because I cannot show agricultural losses, although my forest and open field biodiversity are completely devastated. Uh, the question is, why is it so difficult in some DEC regions to get damage permits for forest damage? So right now, deer damage permits are primarily meant for acute damage that's happening outside of hunting season to agriculture or municipalities. Um, that that um, thinking and rationale largely relates to the scale that impacts is occurring. So the forest regeneration impact that's occurring is over a much broader scale. If you have you know 40 acres or so, and you're trying to address deer populations on that 40 acres to improve forest regeneration, it's going to be nearly impossible to do because all the deer in the surrounding environment are contributing to that forest regeneration failure, and you have no ability to influence what's happening on your neighbor's properties. What we encourage property owners to do is partner with each other so that you can inst institute management over larger scales that would have that greater impact and effectiveness. If you could institute deer management over 500 acres, 1,000 acres with your neighbors and all have DMAP permits and you know um, recreational hunting happening on your properties, maybe you can improve the forest regeneration situation, especially if you're also doing silviculture practices and invasive species removal and all, the, all these other things. So it's really encouraging property owners to think bigger about what they're doing and really understand the scale of management necessary to be effective. And are the recommendations listed being seriously considered by uh, DEC leadership? Say that again. Are the recommendations listed being seriously considered by DEC leadership? Yes. These are these are articulated in our Appendix 8 in our current deer management plan. These are the things that we want to see happen as an agency to improve the deer management situation. Cool. And we just have a few more here. Um, one of your points was to allow deer hunting with firearms equipped with sound suppression. In what way does that help the problem? So this is primarily related to um, culling. So one of our primary partners in um, the deer management realm is USDA APHIS. They go into these communities with sharpshooters, trained sharpshooters, and remove deer strategically from these areas where recreational hunting isn't an, an effective option. And sound suppression allows them to remove multiple deer in one particular sit or setting, as opposed to shooting without sound suppression, scaring the entire group of deer out of the area and not having opportunity to take multiple deer at once. So sound suppression allows uh, multiple deer to be taken in one particular area very efficiently and effectively without spooking deer out of the area. Uh, here's a great question that I would love to hear your response to, uh, Brendan. What can an individual homeowner in the Adirondacks do to reduce the deer population on their land? So consider opening your property to recreational hunting. Consider doing habitat management on your property, whether it be invasive species removal or silviculture on your property. Um, if you have, you know, a large enough acreage, consider enrolling in DMAP. Consider enrolling in DDP. Work with your neighbors to build a, a cooperative so that multiple property owners are engaged in deer management. Those are all things that property owners can do. Cool. And uh, Hugh makes a comment, USDA through NRCS has some funding for deer exclosures. Just a, an FYI for everyone out there. Um, does a smaller deer population result in larger deer? And if so, how? Yeah, this is a really, really important to, uh, point as well. So <clears throat> as I mentioned previously, when deer exceed habitat carrying capacity, it's also not good for the deer, not just because they may die um, due to a severe winter event, but they also start experiencing what's called nutrient limitations. There's not enough food on the landscape for them to reach the optimal body size and antler development that they would achieve if resources were abundant. And so um, this is also something to consider if, if you're a hunter, if you want to experience hunting with large antlered bucks, big body sizes for, for meat consumption, having a lower deer density is actually beneficial because those deer that are on the landscape will have enough resources to consume and reach their, their potential, essentially. All right, we're just going to do two more, and then we're going to move on here. Um, do they have any studies that show that increased deer populations result in a reduction of upland birds like ruffed grouse? 
Uh, I haven't seen any studies specifically focused on ruffed grouse. The studies that do exist primarily are for um, songbirds and ground nesting birds. Um, many of those studies were conducted in Pennsylvania. I'd have to do some more research on that. But what's interesting about these studies is that they're, um, they often refer to what's, this, what's called as this ghost of deer browse past or these legacy effects. Even uh, two or three decades after deer populations have been reduced, these other species are still in reduced numbers and abundance at these settings in these locations because of how long it takes these systems to recover after deer have been reduced. So it's not like you can just re remove the deer, reduce the deer population, and the situation is going to improve. It's a long-term effort, and it's going to require so quite some time, especially if the habitat has become um, degraded to a point where those legacy effects exist. All right, I'll throw one more at you here. This is a two-part question. Um, if population goals are not to reduce deer numbers, how is DEC trying to mitigate deer impact? And also, how do DEC's stated climate change forest regeneration goals affect deer number goals? Yeah, so let me address the first part of that. So in areas where we're attempting to maintain the population, essentially we're trying to issue enough antlerless deer tags and encourage enough antlerless harvest where the population does not increase. In some areas of the state, we're being effective in that. In other areas of the state, we're not. And so we may need to utilize other tools in those areas where we're not being effective. DMAP and DDP can still be accessed and utilized in those units where our objective is to maintain the population. Those two programs are based on deer impacts. So if you have a population um, that is at maintenance level at the WMU scale, you can still receive acute damage in a particular area if you have a, a preferred crop, as an example. And you might need to utilize those other tools. So um, you can still access and utilize DMAP and DDP. The second part of the question, um, I'm not sure I fully grasped. So it's it's how do our deer management objectives relate to DEC's climate change goals? Yeah, how do DEC's stated climate change forest regeneration goals affect deer number goals? So again, we're utilizing some of the same research in our decision making processes. We want to ensure that deer are not impacting forest regeneration, and so our forests can contribute to climate change mitigation, and that's part of the reason why our new deer management plan emphasizes that so heavily. Um, so they should be interconnected. They should be um, uh, mutually supportive of each other in trying to achieve the forest regeneration necessary to improve climate change mitigation. Yeah, thanks so much, Brendan, for answering all those questions. And thanks to all of you for putting so many great questions in the chat. Uh, I did get a direct message from someone, and I just want to quickly answer it. Will a recording of this presentation be posted online somewhere? And then the answer is yes. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel. And I'll also send out an email. It usually takes up to a day for everything to upload. But uh, within a day or so, you should receive an email from me with the link um, to the, the posting on YouTube as well. Uh, so yes. And next up, we have uh, Zach Simic from APIP. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, thank you, Brendan. Um, that was it's always fascinating to hear your talks. And um, for those of you who don't know, Brendan used to work with us here at APIP at the Adirondacks. So it's kind of like deja vu having to follow you again in a presentation, but I'll, I'll do my best. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna talk about some of the invasive species that do benefit from high levels of deer browse um, so Brendan talked a little bit about how, or quite a bit about how deer are one of the major drivers that can influence the abundance and diversity of plants on the landscape. Um, and in many cases, some of these invasive species are what we would sort of consider a passenger rather than a driver of ecosystem change. So it's actually the abundance of deer that are making these plants more prevalent on the landscape, not just the, the plants themselves. So I'm gonna talk about four species that benefit from deer. Um, this list, of course, could be quite a bit longer, but we don't have time to talk about all of the species today. And I want to I want you all to walk away from this presentation with an understanding of how to identify these four species. So hopefully you're feeling a little bit motivated and inspired after Brendan's talk. And when we hop off the webinar today, maybe you'll take a walk through your backyard or you'll visit some of your favorite public properties and take a little bit closer look at the landscape. And as you think about some of the impacts that deer have, 
and have an understanding of how to identify some of these species, you may be able to better understand the impact that deer are having to some of these landscapes. So the four species I'll talk about today are Japanese stiltgrass, garlic mustard, uh, Japanese barberry, and invasive bittersweet. So I'm going to provide a very slight Adirondack lens to this, this talk because we are you know, based out of the Adirondacks. But these four species are relevant across New York State. You'll, you'll find them pretty much everywhere. Um, but here in the Adirondacks, um, Japanese stiltgrass is a fairly uncommon species. It's really only found around the Lake George um, area. Uh, whereas these other three species are quite right. widespread throughout the Adirondack Park and our prism and widespread across New York State as well. So you're likely to find these as you're um, recreating across the landscape. And the first three that I'll talk about, Japanese stiltgrass, garlic mustard, and barberry, are ones that benefit from deer browse because they are um, in that category of unpal unpalatable, um, unpalatable ability, excuse me. Um, so they're, they're things that deer don't like to eat. Um, so they're able to fill in the voids left behind when native vegetation is consumed. And this last one, invasive bittersweet, is a little bit different in the sense that it is one that is often preferred or has been found in research to be preferred by deer. So when they consume it and eat its berries, as Brendan discussed, it's one that they're able to move across the landscape. All right, so let's take a closer look at some of these species and talk about how they can be identified. So the first is Japanese stillgrass. Um, this is an annual sprawling grass that you can find in a variety of different settings. It is a species that is um, adaptable to low light conditions. So you can find it in a closed canopy in the forest understory, but it will also do very well in edge habitats. So along a forest edge or in areas with greater light, like an open field or even human dominated disturbed sites. The grass itself is an annual and it can grow up to three and a half feet tall. Although when we see it here in a lot of our sites in the Adirondacks, it's often much lower than that, growing to heights of maybe one or two feet. Um, as Brendan mentioned, this is a species that is high in lignin, so it is not one that is very palatable for deer. They don't choose to, chew, to eat this one um, if there are other more palatable things on the landscape. Taking a closer look at this species, how do you identify it? It has leaves that are lancelet shaped, so think about like a knight's lance. It's wider at the base and coming to a fine point. They are light green in color. And on their top surface, they have this distinctive silver midrib. So you may be able to make out in this photograph, there's this small silver stripe that runs along the long um, length of the leaf. This is one of the unique diagnostic features of Japanese stiltgrass. Um, additionally, if you were to feel the surface of this leaf, so um, kind of grab it between your fingers and run your fingers from the base to the tip, you will notice that in both directions, the leaf of this plant is smooth. If you contrast that with some of our native grasses, our other non-native grasses, uh, many of those species will have a rough texture in at least one direction. So again, a smooth surface and this distinctive silver midrib are two of the key diagnostic features for this species. Towards mid to late summer, Japanese stiltgrass will produce its uh, inflorescence or its flower which is a small delicate spike that is at the top of the plant, um, pretty uh, sort of plain and inconspicuous looking. And Japanese stiltgrass is native to uh, much of Asia and Japan. And as I mentioned it, in the Adirondacks, it is really only known to be around the Lake George region, but across New York State, it is a bit more prevalent. The next species that I'll talk about is, is garlic mustard. So this is a plant that has a, a chemical adaptation that makes it less palatable to deer. So as its name implies, garlic mustard, it has a garlic or oniony sort of odor and a bitter taste that makes it unpalatable or undesirable to a lot of browsing species like deer. It is what we would call a biennial. In other words, it takes two years of growth for it to reach maturity and to release seed. What you're looking at in this photo is the second year or the mature version of this plant. A mature plant can grow um, up to about four feet tall, although height will be variable depending on the site and the conditions of the site. If it's really happy, I've seen these plants reach over five feet. If it's growing in a more uh, mesic or 
lower quality site, they may only reach about one foot tall before they begin to seed and, um, and, and decline. This is another one like stilt grass that can grow in low light conditions. So you'll often find it in forest understories with a closed canopy, but it'll also do very well on those edge habitats where sun is a little bit more abundant. So the leaves of garlic mustard are variable depending on the uh, stage of life. So in its first year, uh, garlic mustard exists as what we would call a rosette. So this left-hand photograph, just a small bunch of leaves that are roughly heart to kidney shaped. They are a bright kind of lime green with a sort of glossy top surface. And they have uh, uh, not, not a very sharp, but a toothed edge here. So you can see these sort of blunt toothed edges along the margin of the leaf. As garlic mustard matures into its second year of life, those leaves will become a bit more triangular in shape and those teeth along the edges become a bit more sharp. So not quite as blunt, um, a little bit more of a sharp appearance. Again, as its name implies, garlic mustard does have a garlicky aroma. So if you crush the leaves between your fingers, you can often identify it using that key diagnostic feature. Garlic mustard flowers in the early summer, uh, late spring period, and it produces a small white flower with four petals. And those petals are typically arranged in the shape of a plus sign or a cross. And the, the blooming period is pretty short lived. So once a plant comes into bloom, we usually only see flowers persist for a couple of weeks. And then they will fade and give rise to the plant's seed pods, which are uh, referred to as siliques. So these long sort of slender, green bean like structures that will be a bright green color when immature and as they develop and ripen will turn to a light brown color they dry out will open and release the small uh, black dark brown seeds that garlic mustard produces so this is its primary uh, spread mechanism um, and these seeds are quite viable they can remain in the soil for many years And garlic mustard is native to a wide portion of Eurasia, Europe, and, and uh, Western Asia. And it's one that's quite prevalent here in the Adirondacks. We often find it in um, recreational areas such as trailheads, campgrounds, and along the edges of hiking trails. But you can find it in some undisturbed um, forest understories as well, particularly where those deer are abundant, like the Champlain Valley. Next is Japanese barberry. So probably everyone on this call has heard of or seen Japanese barberry because of its prevalence as a commercial and residential landscape plant. Um, so this is a woody shrub and it is one that is not desired by deer because it has a physical defense. So if you've ever planted or handled Japanese barberry, you know that it is covered with numerous sharp spines. So it's one that's simply difficult for anything to browse upon. Although I will say just in personal sort of anecdote and experience in my time spent in the woods, I have seen sort of opportunistic nibbling on a uh, barberry by a deer while I've been sitting in my own tree stand. I see them sort of nibble on the tender tips or the berries of this shrub. Uh, but the amount of browse pressure they, that they exert on this plant is not enough that will um, control it or remove it from the landscape. Um, the size of the shrub, it can be quite variable depending on the, on the site where it's growing. In open or full sun conditions, you'll often see them grow larger, whereas in the forest understory, they'll remain a bit more compact. Um, but they can grow in a wide range of conditions, everything from very low light to full sun. The leaves of Japanese barberry are uh, teardrop shaped so they have a wider base further from the stem and then they come to this fine tip where they attach to um, the, the, the shrubs twigs. They have a smooth or entire margin along the edge of the leaf so no teeth here you can see it's a nice smooth um, surface or edge and this is in contrast to a closely related species that I'll just briefly mention so we do also have something called common or European barberry that is present on the landscape looks very similar to Japanese barberry, but one of the differences is that common or European barberry will have a tooth or serrated edge at the end of its leaf. So again, Japanese barberry has that smooth edge. 
Leaves are typically bright green in color when we find this plant in a forest understory, although in a landscape setting there are uh, different color morphs or cultivars available, so you'll often see this growing um, in sort of uh, a garden landscape in a deep purple or sometimes a bright yellow lime green um, cultivar. But when they're in a forest understory, they're almost exclusively sort of the natural green that you're seeing here on this slide. The flowers of Japanese barberry are small and pretty inconspicuous. They're, they're born or, or will bloom in the um, mid to late spring or early summer, depending on where you are in the state. And they're not very long lived. So the bloom period is pretty short. And then the shrub will give rise to its berries, which are these small, um, approximately quarter inch wide uh, cylindrical berries that will be bright green as they're developing and will ripen to this bright red that you see here in the lower photograph. And these berries will be uh, present on the shrub in the mid to late summer, and they can remain pretty persistent through the fall and into the winter if they're not um, you know, picked off by birds or other wildlife. And as I mentioned, Japanese barberry does have a physical defense, which is why it is not a very desirable species uh, for browsing. So it has the sharp spines along the length of its stem and for Japanese barberry, it's most often a singular spine that you will see on the stem where the leaves meet um, the twig. I mentioned that common or European barberry, a close lookalike, that species will often have sort of a crow's foot or a set of three spines where the leaf meets the stem. And Japanese barberry, as its name implies, is native to Japan and parts of East Asia. Um, you can find this one across much of the Adirondacks um, in both natural and developed landscapes. And it's one that we have quite a bit of here around our office in Keene Valley in forest understories where our deer are locally abundant. And the last species that I'll mention is invasive bittersweet. So this one, remember, we're contrasting a little bit and that is actually a preferred um, browse species for deer. They will feed on this and it does have a fleshy berry that deer will consume and then can spread across the landscape. But invasive bittersweet is a large uh, perennial deciduous vine that can grow up to heights of 60 feet or more. And it likes to wrap around other types of sort of host vegetation or even structures. So you'll see it um, twirling and climbing up native trees. You may see it climbing up power poles or guy wires anything that it can wrap itself around to reach up into the uh, canopy to access more light. So unlike some of our other species we talked about that can grow very well in low light conditions, this is one that is more often associated with edge habitats. It does like to have a little bit more light. Um, so you'll see it growing along roadsides, forest edges, on the edges of fields, etc. cetera. Um, that being said, you will find you know, sort of straggling stems in the understory where light is, is less available, but they won't, won't grow um, quite as robustly as they would in higher light conditions. So the stems of invasive bittersweet are woody and they can be quite variable in size depending on the age of the plant. So most often when I see this vine, it's fairly young and, and new, and I would liken the diameter, the width of the vine to be that of like a pencil. Um, but as they are become more established and become more mature, this, this vine can get quite large. Um, I've seen mature vines with a diameter of six inches or more. So it can become pretty robust. And it's actually the size and the weight of these mats of vegetation that can have uh, negative impacts on its you know, trees that it's growing up can actually topple uh, mature trees just given the weight of the vegetation. Um, but it is light brown in color and it will be covered with these sort of uh, small openings known as lenticels. Um, these are these little spots along the length of the vine. The leaves of invasive bittersweet are fairly plain looking in the sense that they are oval and green. They do have a toothed or serrated edge or margin and they come to this fine tip. The leaves do have um, a petiole or this little um, leaf stem where the leaf attaches to the main woody stem of the plant. And one of the things that I often notice when I'm surveying the landscape or out traveling around is this, this viney growth habit of, of invasive bittersweet. 
so it almost reminds me of like uh, a Medusa head. So all the, the snakes coming out of the of, of Medusa. So it has these sort of reaching fingers or, or vines that are extending out from uh, sort of the heart of the infestation and looking for something to, to grab on. So it's sort of this crazy scraggly appearance that will often catch my eye and clue me into this particular plant. And actually right now, as we enter the early to mid fall, it is a decent time to be looking for this species because it has a pretty distinct fall foliage. As the leaves begin to senesce, they will turn a very bright yellow green. Um, so as you're driving around, if you see these big mats of vegetation covering the forest edge, and those leaves are bright green in color, you may be looking at um, invasive bittersweet. So the flowers of this are pretty, again, inconspicuous, not really showy. Um, they'll emerge in the mid to late summer and then give rise to the fleshy berries that are consumed by uh, birds, small mammals, and other wildlife. The berries will begin as a bright green color and as they ripen and mature, will turn orange. And then those orange, um, the outer orange coating on the berries or these husks will open to release the bright red berry inside, which is what you can see in this lower photograph. Um, so towards the end of summer is when you'll begin to see these mature berries and they'll remain persistent on the vine um, until they are fed on by wildlife or eventually drop in the late uh, fall or early winter. And uh, invasive bittersweet is native to uh, much of the uh, much of the continent or, or much of Asia, and it is one that is sort of mixed in its distribution here in our Adirondack region. We'll see quite a bit of it around um, sort of the Keene Valley, Keene area, in the Champlain Valley, and around Lake George. In sort of interior portions of the Adirondacks, it is not as common, but it is certainly uh, gaining a foothold in some communities. So that is all we will talk about as far as specific species today. I will just add, if you are interested in learning more about um, not only plants that benefit from deer, but just invasive species in general that we have here in the Adirondacks, I would encourage everyone on this call to check out some of our other training opportunities, particularly those that we offer in the spring and summer, where we'll take a deeper dive into a wider suite of species that are affecting our region. All right, thanks a lot, Zach. Very good. Uh, last but not least, we're going to get into some best practices for preventing the spread of invasive species. So we know that uh, invasive species can be spread in a number of ways. Um, it's true that animals can spread invasive species uh, with their fur by you know, consuming a berry and then depositing uh, a seed elsewhere. Uh, species like Japanese knotweed love to grow along. Uh, stream edges where they, they love to just be swept away by that water so they can take root elsewhere downstream. Uh, but by and large, the primary mover of invasive species is uh, humans and human activity. And you can see uh, Smokey the invasive species bear there is reminding you that only you can prevent the spread of invasive species. And, and that's very true. But the good news is it's pretty simple to do that. So invasive species get around uh, in a number of ways through human activity. Uh, if you look in the top left there, you, you see a lot of mud. Well, uh, look at that bike chain. It's covered in mud. Look at those that, those boots, those hiking boots. Uh, if you've ever been in a muddy forest or slipped in the mud while climbing a high peak like I have, you know that mud sticks to just about everything. Uh, it can stick to clothing. It can stick to dirt hiking boots, things like that. Uh, invasive species, uh, seeds or plant fragments can also get stuck in mud, as can um, eggs and things like that. So as you're moving around and you're walking through mud, you have the potential to pick up plant fragments, seeds, eggs, and inadvertently uh, transport them to another area. Uh, much related to that, uh, by bushwhacking, uh, taking informal trails, allowing uh, a dog to just run around through the woods, uh, anything that is, you know, stuck to the fur, stuck to your boot or clothing um, can then be spread deeper into the forest uh, where it can not only uh, grab a hold, but it can also be a little harder to detect because you're, you're going into an area that's um, not as frequented by people. And of course, firewood, you've probably heard, or I should say, I hope you've heard, uh, don't move firewood. Um, the reason why is because invasive uh, insects, uh, also called forest pests, and their eggs uh, can inhabit firewood. 
And if you're moving that firewood to a new area, um, you're you know presenting a pathway for those species, those eggs to to get out and to become established elsewhere. So really, you know, adapting behavior is. Um, something that we stress a lot, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's it's a lot easier to prevent invasive species from spreading than it is to deal with them once they've arrived. So how do we adapt our behavior to, to kind of address this situation? Um, knowing your surroundings, knowing your plants, and knowing your habitat are really important. Zach went over four invasive species um, a little while ago. Uh, APIP has a terrestrial field guide of two invasive species that I'll talk about in, in a couple of minutes. And there are plenty of tools online to kind of familiarize you with uh, invasive species. Uh, you know, when you learn to recognize something, you can also learn to, to avoid it and, and learn to report it. And, and those are very important steps that we can all take. And then don't move firewood. Uh, that's in all caps because it's very important. Um, most Campgrounds, uh, especially state campgrounds, have firewood available. It's pretty easy to find at roadside stands like the one pictured here as well. Um, there is a state regulation, 50 miles. Uh, you're not supposed to move firewood more than 50 miles, but really the shorter the distance, the better. Uh, I, I would strongly recommend just avoid moving it all together if you can and just buy wood where it is, burn it where you are. And then if you have any wood left over, leave it for the next person to burn uh, as well. We don't want to be uh, transporting any forest pests around and not moving firewood is, is a huge step that we can all take to to avoid doing that. And then stay on the trail. I, I know this is difficult for you know folks if they're out hunting and things like that, um, but bushwhacking and you know charging through the forest uh, can spread invasive species, as I mentioned earlier. Um, avoiding muddy trails in general is is good practice. Um, trails are best hiked when they're when they're hardened. Uh, muddy trails, uh, you know, getting a lot of people hiking on a muddy trail can degrade that trail further. Uh, if you are out hiking, and I know in the Adirondacks it's sometimes hard to avoid muddy trails, um, walk through the mud. Don't walk around it. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one is by walking around mud on a trail, you are in fact widening the trail, um, but you're also putting yourself in closer contact with the vegetation that's growing alongside of that trail. Uh, and you know, again, that's where you might pick up invasive species. So for for the sake of the trail and for not spreading invasive species, if you can avoid hiking when it's muddy, please do so. And if you are hiking and you come across some mud, you know, hiking boots are made to, to withstand mud and water and things like that. Just, just walk right through it. And lastly, you know, if a trail is closed, it's generally for a really good reason. So if you come across a trail that's closed and no matter how much you really want to hike it that day, um, please avoid hiking uh, on closed trails. And that could also be a safety issue as well uh, for, for you personally. And we could easily adapt some of our behavior um, to help avoid the spread of invasive species. So you may have heard the phrase play, clean, go. And what this really speaks to is just cleaning all of your equipment, all of those ways that an invasive species or you know plant parts, seeds, whatever can, can stick to you. It, it's all about making sure that that doesn't happen. So when you arrive at a trail, it's really important to clean your gear before you head out on the trail and when you return. So it's kind of a fail safe of if there's anything left over on those boots or on that gear, you're cleaning it off before you even set foot or tire onto the trail. And then when you come back, you're you know, doing the same thing. Um, you're, you're cleaning yourself off, you're cleaning your bike off, uh, and, and hopefully uh, any invasive species fragments along with it. Uh, at the top left there, you can see a boot brush station. You'll find those uh, around the park. Uh, there's actually a map on our adkinvasives.com that'll show you where those are located. Um, yeah, give those boots a quick brush before you hit the trail and, and when you come back. And to the right of that, you'll see it's basically a handheld boot brush station. Uh, it's a little brush that you can keep in your pack, and that's really good for cleaning off bike tires, uh, you know, kind of brushing off your pants and, um, you know, picking. You can use the pick there to get between your your treads on your on your tire or on your hiking boot as well. Um, pet waste, you know, good practice, good consideration is to pack it in and pack it out, um, but that also helps prevent the spread of invasive species. And then parking, you know, invasive species, they, they don't really discriminate what they stick to. They can easily stick to your car, your car tires. So just be aware of that when you're parking um, alongside the road at a part at a trailhead or even in your driveway of, of what's growing alongside uh, of where your car is and, you know, the potential for spread there. 
And when we talk about being on the lookout, it's not just walking along and saying like, hey, I think that's an invasive species and just making a mental note. Uh, we really ask people use the IMAP Invasives app to report invasive species. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, uh, but I did just want to touch on it here. And we're talking a lot about forests today. But there are aquatic invasive species too. Um, you know, plants and animals live in on land and in water. Uh, hopefully, by now you've heard the "clean, drain, dry" uh, slogan. Uh, it is more than just a slogan here in New York State. Um, boaters are required to clean, drain, dry all watercraft uh, before launching in New York State waters, and you should also do that uh, when you take that watercraft out of the water. And it's not only boats; it's anything that comes near the water. So you know, trailers, paddles, life vests, fishing and swimming gear. Uh, Stand-up paddle boards, waders, anything like that could spread invasive species in much the same way that I just discussed with uh, the terrestrial species, any of those little plant fragments especially. We want to keep them from spreading to other water bodies. The good news is there are boat wash stations found throughout the Adirondacks, and there are maps uh, that show those locations. And we also have um, wa wader wash stations for folks who are out fly fishing. And last but not least, this is really important. If you're using live bait, please, please, please do not release it to a body of water. If that live bait happens to be an invasive species, you're basically dumping a bucket of invasive species into the water. So properly dispose of unwanted live bait in the trash. Um, never, ever release it into a water body. So we've talked a little bit about knowing what to look for. There are a lot of resources for that. Um, again, APIP's website's a great resource. I'll talk about our terrestrial field guide in a minute. And then preventing the spread, super important. But how do we put all this together? Well, reporting our sightings. This is the, the third step, and this is uh, one of the most important ones. So if you think you've seen an invasive species, and, and the word think is really what I want to highlight here, even if you're not sure, report it using IMAP invasives. Um, we'd much rather have a report come in and have it end up not being an invasive species than have someone think they've seen it, but they're not sure, so they don't report it, and then it ends up being an invasive species. Um, I'm not going to give a full course on IMAP today because that is kind of a full course, uh, but what I want to do is just kind of give you a really brief overview of how it works and, and hopefully that'll entice you to dig a little deeper and and uh, download the app and so on. So there there is a mobile app and then there is a website for IMAP Invasives. The two work together. Uh, on the right, you'll see an example of IMAP Invasives online. It's a really cool website. I highly recommend just going and checking it out, New York newyorkimapinvasives.org. Uh, it's a database for invasive species, and it shows you where they have been confirmed. Uh, one of my favorite features, and it's a little, a little scary, but you can go in there and type in an invasive species, uh, spotted lanternfly, and it will populate the map with all of the places that spotted lanternfly has been confirmed. Uh, so you could kind of see the range. You can see how it's moving across the landscape. Um, it, it's, it's really, really interesting. And then the mobile app, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. It's um, that, That's what you're going to use if you're out in the field and you, want, you think you see an invasive species. And as you upload your uh, findings to IMAP invasives, if they are confirmed, they will end up on the uh, in the database and people will be able to see them uh, kind of like in the map uh, on the right there. So yeah, the first step is to go to NewYorkIMAPInvasives.org and create an account. It's pretty straightforward. First name, last name, email, uh, password, uh, jurisdiction. is There's a drop down menu there. That's basically where you live. Once you've created your account, you can download the mobile app to your uh, mobile device. And from there, you will link your account to the app. So now it's you're in there, and it knows it's it's you. And it's pretty pretty simple to do all this. Um, and if you think you found an invasive species, this is the fun part: is you you want to report it. You want to use that app to report your observation. So when you open up IMAP Invasives on your cell phone, you're going to see. Uh, the little welcome screen, and then it's going to take you to the next screen uh, where it says add observation. You can see the red arrow pointing to it there. You're going to you're going to touch that, and that's going to open up the observation record screen. And it, it's pretty straightforward. You take a photo of the species with your camera, or you can upload a photo from your um, library on, on your device, and then you select the species that you think it is, and you can do detected or not detected and select the date. And then when you get home, you can upload it to the to the database and someone will look at that species and give it a yes or a no and, and 
that's it. So de detected or not detected, just if that's a little confusing, um, th there are various programs and whatnot where volunteers go out and look for a specific invasive species like beech leaf disease or hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, it's really important if they're going out and doing a trail, for example, that they say, okay, I did this trail, I looked for hemlock woolly adelgid, and I did not see it. That data is really um valuable for scientists as well. So if you do set out and you want to look for a specific species, you can do uh, non-detected. Uh, there's a ton of information about New York uh, IMAP invasives online. You can go to their website and there are training videos and things and PowerPoints and things like that that you can look at to, to really just kind of walk you through the entire website and all the cool features that it has. Um, APIP's YouTube channel, we also have some trainings we've done there uh, and you can check that out. And there's also a lot of trainings on our YouTube channel for identifying various invasive species. So I, if you're interested, and I, and I hope you are, I highly recommend checking this stuff out. Okay, and there's that's where you add an observation. All right, so that was IMAP, and you know, I, I, we, we could talk for a half an hour about IMAP, but I'm going to leave it there. Um, I do want to mention we have outreach materials. They are completely free. Um, on the left there, you'll see three uh, trifold brochures that we have. They fit right in your back pocket, and they go over a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. They do have a few species in them as well. And then underneath those, you'll see a, a couple of posters that we have, um, just reminders for folks on proper procedures for preventing the spread of invasive species. And last but not least, I've mentioned it before, we have the Field Guide to Terrestrial Invasive Species of the Adirondacks. This is a great little guide. It covers, I believe it's 28 invasive species. Most of them are plants. Most of them are not, or are in the Adirondacks. There are a couple in there that are not quite here yet that we want people to be on the lookout for. Uh, the guide is really geared toward a general audience. So in the beginning of it, you're going to find information on how to identify a plant, what features to look for, and then it gets right into the species identifications. And at the end, there is a little information on managing invasive species and a little information on IMAP invasives as well. So you can go to I adkinvasives.com slash order, and you'll see those on there. You can also download these materials as well. Um, but if you put in an order, they, they are completely free, and they usually show up within a week or two. And last but not least, I want to give a shout out to our winter webinar series. Uh, we're putting this together right now. and The exact dates will be announced soon. Um, they're, they're coming together quite quickly. Uh, January 18th, we do know that one, uh, is going to be Adirondack Forest Ecology. We will have a speaker who's going to give a case study on hemlock woolly adelgid in the Smoky, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, this is, you know, it's a species, or it's an invasive pest, rather, that is, is fairly new to the Adirondacks um, that we're, you know, particularly worried about. And and um, he's going to be able to really speak to how devastating uh, hemlock woolly adelgid has been down in the Great Smoky Mountains. And we're also going to have a good overview of forest ecology and an overview of our volunteer forest pest hunters program. Um, so, yeah, that'll be really worth checking out. In February, we're going to talk about tier one invasive species. Uh, tier one species are species that aren't quite here yet. And they're, they're things that we're concerned about, that we're keeping an eye on, that we want people to be on the lookout for. Um, so that will cover um, a lot of the tier one invasive species. And then in March, uh, it's going to be kind of a complement to our forest ecology. We're going to have an Adirondack Lake Ecology webinar. We'll discuss very similar topics as to forest ecology, but for aquatic systems. And to learn more and register an event, again, adkinvasives.com slash events. So are there any um, lingering questions? Thank you all for sticking around. Uh, if there was anything that you wanted to ask Brendan or myself or Zach, and now is the time to do so. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, so if you do have a question you want to come off mute, that'd be that'd be great. All right. Going once, going twice. We get a lot of thank yous. Thank you. And thank you all for coming today. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, I will send out a follow-up email, um, usually within 24 hours or so, and that'll have a link for the, the YouTube recording of this. Uh, and you know, feel free to reach out if you have any more questions. Um, APIP does give trainings uh, to groups. So if, if you're looking to... Um, learn more about IMAP invasives, for example, you can reach out to us. And if you, if you have a group of people who would like to learn about it, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you.
And if no one has any questions, I will give a final thank you to Zach and Brendan for the excellent presentations. Thanks to all of you for being so engaged and asking great questions. Uh, please reach out if you want to know anything else. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.